was on medication and I was a mentally ill patient in a psychiatric ward. Well, Maura, this is a, uh, an absolutely fantastic project that you've put together, but I mean, you had to bare your soul a little bit to do it. So I got to ask, first and foremost, I mean, what was the idea? What was the logic? Why did you say, I'm willing to put myself out there like this? Uh, when I went to Toronto in 2006 to work for the Fight Network, I uh, befriended uh, a guy by the name of Harris Usanovich, 15 years younger than me at the time, in his early 20s, just out of uh, Ryerson University, and uh, an, an editor, and an aspiring cameraman and filmmaker. And we began to, to spend a lot of time together. We became quick friends, and I got to know his family, and uh, he began to see me out of the office a lot more in my apartment where we would just hang out. And it was interesting, I guess, because he was a Pride Fighting Championships fan, so he already knew I was, and, and a big fan of mine, a supporter of mine, watched Muay Thai, which I used to do back when he was a kid, 1999-2000 uh, on TSN in Canada. So the more social time we spent together, the more he realized, wow, there is a, I, I'm, I'm beginning to notice some real changes and, and interesting patterns here with Moro. So one, he showed me a short film he had made in his native Bosnia, where his family's from, and it's just a, and I'm like, you did this by yourself? He goes, yeah. I'm like, dude, you've got talent, man. This is great. So then the more he, he saw of me, he finally just said, more, we got to do something with this. Like, it's an amazing, I, I can't believe you go and call the biggest boxing matches, biggest MMA. You're on Fight Network every day. You're on the radio. You don't, and yet, bro, you're, you're dealing with some serious stuff here, man. And I, I, I think there's something we can do. And I, I've always been an advocate for mental health. I gave myself the nickname Bipolar Rock and Roller way back in the 90s when, you know, as much as we don't talk about mental health now, back then it was almost non-existent. And if, if it was broached, it was done uh, in a very pejorative way. So I, I said, okay, well, maybe we can do a short film on this and, you know, raise awareness or something, a viral video of some kind where we can at least start the conversation. The more we went into this and the more he realized how much of my life was actually on tape because I started my career at 16, uh, you know, wrestling in Canada and even just stuff that we had recorded. Uh, I've always been on camera, always been a bit of a ham, always a performer. We realized that, yeah, this is probably a documentary and, and it is a rather unique and compelling look at not only someone who was, you know, working at the highest level of his profession, but what that person has had to endure and, and, and go through and realizing how many millions of people around the world, depression is one of the leading causes of death around the world. Here in the United States, one in five people will suffer from mental health issues and the rippling effect. It's not only the person who suffers, the entire family and the social circle. And so because of the stigmas that we still face, the snap out of it, oh, you're faking it, you're looking for attention. Oh, come on, man, go get some fresh air. Just, I want people to realize, no, this is legitimate, and you see it in all of its rawest form, and I, I don't mind being the proverbial canary in the coal mine. I don't even mind being a casualty. If this were to cost me some work, so be it. Thankfully, Showtime, WWE, Paramount Network, all of my media friends, the amount of feedback I've received, first of all, is humbling. I got goosebumps. But the support and the fact that so many people are saying we need this now. You have inspired me to phone a therapist. You've inspired me to tell my wife. And it really is about the men, John. The alpha male syndrome that we all, especially in my world and your, our world, where you know, you, you show weakness, they say, or you're, you're ashamed of, of, of showing uh, the, the fact that maybe you need to cry or maybe you need to, to, to get some help. I want to make it so that it's okay to not be okay. I want people to realize that there is hope for everyone. The fact that we are losing so many people to suicide because of a stigma. I've looked at the, the, the chandeliers in the hospital room, the light fixtures, wondering if it could hold my weight. I know the feeling. And because we're not in a wheelchair, because I'm not on crutches, because I don't take insulin or even have cancer to go and have chemotherapy, all debilitating, all incredibly egregious. I'm here to tell you, John, that I would I would welcome any of those scenarios compared to what we have to go through on a daily basis. And the, and the real pain and suffering is because of the fact it, it's so unnecessary. 
So that's why I don't mind burying my soul as I'm doing now and in the documentary because I want to save one life. I was going to ask you, I mean, because watching this, I mean, knowing you as a friend and knowing you as a colleague, it, it, I think it made it even more real and more powerful. I think anybody that watches it, it's, it's so well done. I mean, I was brought to tears on a couple different occasions. But I wonder for you, you know, seeing the project come together and watching it from the outside looking in for the first time, I mean, was there any part of you that was like, this is too much, you sure. know, this is, I, I, can't, I can't let people see this side of me. <laughs> it's funny. I, 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 wanted to be, I wanted it to be worse, to be honest. When I saw it, and don't get me wrong, it was, it was startling. It was, I felt awkward. I felt embarrassed. At times I cringed. Uh, but I realized what the impact was with everyone else in the room and, and for me. And so I, I actually made sure I wanted the documentary to be bipolar because my life in a nutshell has been. It's not just a diagnosis or even a label. It is the fact that I have, you know, if I experience, I call the two biggest pay-per-views in combat sports history. I've been at WrestleMania. I started my career at 16 on national television in Canada. And yet I've been hospitalized eight to I don't, uh, multiple times in my 20s. Didn't think I would escape my 20s. At 21, in my first full-time radio job, which was in my hometown, you know, if anyone knows about the radio life, you have to go to Timbuktu and make $500 a month eating macaroni and cheese and tuna. I, I got to sleep in my own bed and, and be the local, you know, celebrity. Within months, I was hospitalized after, and because I was still dealing with the, the death of my best friend at 19, Michael Jansen, which triggered my first uh, real big meltdown that led to my diagnosis. But I wrote a, a resignation letter because I realized this is not for me. I mean, I did what I did. I was on TV. I God, you know, gave me my opportunity to be what I wanted to do, but I'm done. I guess I have to get a regular job or live at home. Um, and so I, may, I wrote the letter. My father, who he and I have had an interesting relationship my whole life, old school Italian. The discipline was maybe borderline <laughs> criminal at times growing up. But, I, you know, I love my dad. I love my mom. I love my entire family. And they've been there for me throughout this whole ordeal. Thankfully, he didn't send the letter. And the program director of the radio station, this is 1991, Brian Labor in Chilliwack. Instead of saying, well, what are we doing? This guy, we just gave him a job. He's going to be gone three months. Are you kidding? Uh, he said, no. There's enough potential, raw talent, work ethic, desire, and he's a good kid. Let's give him a chance. And it began there. And, and I know I've been so fortunate in my life to have everyone look out for me. And I know that there are millions of people, and people will be watching this, that have nobody. And that is what breaks my heart. And that is what uh, makes me say, you know what? Yeah, I'm a combat sports announcer. I've, I've had a great career. I want my legacy to be just trying to save people live, people's lives through, through advocacy and through action. I'm, this is just the beginning, John. This, this documentary is just a launch pad. And as there was a picture I put on Instagram, it was like out of The Godfather, Frank Shamrock took of me at the end of this. Like the, the, the other end of the table was in another time zone. But I'm like, plenty of room at the table for mental health warriors, and the feedback's been astounding. It's, it's a very powerful piece. I think whether people know you and know your career or not, you know, I think they're going to learn something from it for sure. I want to ask you, you know, about the disease itself, kind of understanding. I mean, you mentioned the, the tragic loss of your friend as, as, as a young man that kind of triggered it. I mean, did that help the progression? I mean, did that contribute to the progression and to what happened? I mean, had that tragedy been avoided, would, would, would life be different for you? I don't understand exactly how it worked. Good question. Uh, hindsight being 2020, I think it first began manifesting itself when I got my TV job at 16 uh, in high school, uh, discovered by the wrestling promoter that I'd been watching as a kid and had been visualizing at five years old at the events as a debilitatingly shy, nerdy child that this, uh, this is my world. I'm going to be in this world. And having it come true literally years later, I think it, 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 the mania began to manifest because my on-camera appearances, even looking back now, like they were, people were raving about it. Like, this is real and raw. This guy's amazing. But it, it's pretty extreme. It's pretty manic. So, and that is the, the, the gift that comes with the curse. And that's the bipolar. They, because my, I believe it without, the, and I wish my best friend was still here because, wow, what a journey it's been. And he would have been, he was a bigger boxing fan than I was. He told me at 18 that I was going to work for Vince McMahon one day. He died at 19. I worked for Vince McMahon at 46. Um, but the, the bipolar disorder and mental health issues, and I can only speak for myself, is 
you, you I'm in rare variation of mixed states. And even now I can tell talking to you, I, the rapid speech, I have racing thoughts, I uh, no need for sleep. There was a period of time at, at that time where I'd be doing morning radio. I'd go to the school to call a basketball, football, uh, volleyball game for local television, then go DJ at a nightclub for four hours, go from the nightclub, sleep an hour on the boss's couch at the radio station, repeat it. So I knew there, there was something going on. Um, uh, very impulsive, um, drinking a lot, so, uh, um, very promiscuous as, as much as, you know, that's a big part of this, by the way, with bi mental health. The, 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 uh, you put yourself in risky positions. And so what happened to me, the death triggered all of this, and what started the family noticing, I, my irritability factor was off the roof. I would start crying for no reason. I would s fantasize about my funeral and about death, and, and I was just not in a good place. And everyone thought I was on drugs. Everyone thought I was just an alcoholic. There was a period of time I remember well, 42 consecutive days where I drank myself into a stupor as a nightclub DJ, obviously trying to, to self-medicate. When the diagnosis was made, I fought it, just like everybody else. There's no effing way you're calling me crazy. Uh, you're crazy. Uh, everyone else is wrong. And I ended up, like I say, uh, in emergency, brought to a psychiatric ward. When I began to start doing research and reading about mental health and, and bipolar disorder, I thought, wow, I could have written every single word here. And that's where I began to then think, you know, if, it, if, if, if I'm one of the, you know, how many others? Like, I thought, does it run in my family, which I quickly discovered on my mother's side, multi-generational. I have a cousin, Claudio, a brilliant chef, owns an amazing restaurant in Vancouver. He's bipolar. Uh, we, we, we know that it can be a wide variety of factors. And John, this is what really scares me even talking to you about this. At the end of the day, we really don't know all that much. They tell you, here, take this pill. Why? Because it, it's been shown that it works for your type of illness. Well, why does it work? We don't know. Well, thank you, but no thank you. I don't want the side effects that I've experienced, 30 pounds on lithium. Uh, they gave me something called Latuta once, where the very first night I took it, and no, hyperbole, right? The greatest word ever? Ronaldo knows hyperbole. No word of a lie for four hours in my apartment, I paced to the point that I was about to run off the patio and jump off the sun deck and end it. And that's, that's supposed to help me. So I sit here and I've, I've told everyone, and there's, speaking of stigma, the only thing in my life that has ever, ever helped me be normal is cannabis. And <laughs> without cannabis, I would not be working Without cannabis, I would not be alive. And take that for what you will. Um, it has allowed me to write what I write. It has allowed me to be sociable with people in situations where otherwise I would be anxiety ridden or um, just not in a good place. So while I sit here and, and I know about Will Wheaton, the actor who, who talks about antidepressants and, and believe me, I know that they help people and people need to seek treatment, John. But please do your due diligence. Please do your research because big pharma is literally killing us. Well, I was going to ask. I mean, that was, it kind of is a, is a subplot almost of the documentary. It's just a little piece of it. But I know this is. Well, all, I wanted all... it to be much larger. But again, we live in a society where we're still wondering about that as well, right? So then that country. might answer the question because I mean, this is very much about mental health. But I was wondering if you hope that that's you know another message that gets out there is that you know cannabis needs to be a little bit more accepted. One hundred percent. And I I wish my mother would would take it. I wish. Uh, so many people I know who I've, are victims of the stigma. Well, I'm not going to turn crazy. Oh, that, that makes you lazy. That, you know, all you get are the munchies. Or, oh, you sit and melt in the couch. Or, yeah, only dumb people do that and lazy people. <laughs> yeah, lazy people. Anyone look at my work schedule lately? So, I, again, I, what it's done for me, and I even said this, I wish there was something in cannabis, and yes, I know CBD is a, a big thing right now for people, but for me it is the THC. And I don't know if there's a, a, an amount of THC that they can be put in a pill safely without the maybe overly euphoric effects to, to help people, but I wish more is, in, is investigated. And on top of all this, John, when it comes to mental health treatment, and, and even me now dealing with it for 28 years, and, and, and it's a constant work in progress. There is no cure, my man. We need resources, and for, if it's not for me, for the, for the people who put their bloody lives on the line to go somewhere 
to, to, to fight for this country or for fight for their country, and then we just cast them off when we bring them home? They need mental health help. We need to put millions of dollars, and again, as, as, the, as I know cancer is, is the worst, I get it, but we all know about cancer. We all know, we, we discuss it openly. Why can't we do the same thing with something that is literally killing people? Because they can't talk about it, or they're made to feel like they can't talk about it. So what is the overall goal with this? I mean, education, you said, you know, kind of smashing the stigma is something that you say in there. But what, what really can be done? As you said, I mean, it, we need funds, we need yes. resources. So, so give me the, the overarching goal for this project. The, the main goal for me was to, to show people what mental health really looks like and, and to show the, 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 the positive, because I'm fully functional as a human being and successful at my job, to show the, the, the drawbacks, the impact on families, uh, to educate, to have uh, experts talk about the illness and, and, and what it is, but mainly to try to get one person sitting out there watching this documentary going, oh my God, this is me, but I haven't been able to tell anybody because I've been ashamed, I've been embarrassed. Maybe I don't need this rope. Maybe I can put this rope down and make a call and get some help. And already, just with the, the 30 seconds and the one minute teaser, and uh, whether through Instagram, Twitter, email, I, I can't tell you how many people have already said save their life or try to save their life. So what more, I mean, as a human being, guys, I, I know, yeah, we want to succeed in life. We want to have a, a career. Too many people don't chase their dreams out of fear. I'm mentally ill. I never stop chasing my dream. So please, you know, just don't suffer in silence. And, and I know people out there are going to be watching saying, yeah, this is all nice and what a feel-good story, but so what? The, the, you know, the next day we go on with our lives and there's so many people that are living with this condition right now that, well, how dare you, you know, now? Like, it, it, m people are ashamed. They're embarrassed. Of what? So I, I applaud those of uh, my, my brethren in Hollywood, in the music industry, Logic, man, what a, what a great dude. Uh, DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, the NBA, uh, Mariah Carey. Just please, guys, it, it's, oh man, this, is, this could be so easy to fix, really. Just change the mindset. What should people do if somebody is, if it is that one person that's watching and they say, I identify with that, I know exactly what Moral's talking about, what should that person do? Where, where, where can they reach out? Who should they turn to? There are, um, thankfully, a, a lot of great organizations out there, including NAMI, uh, the National uh, Alliance of Mental Illness, and, and you know what? The doctors. We need better uh, medical conditions. I was hospitalized in America one time. I have money, so I, I, I thought I was paying for the best treatment. I've never been in jail, John. I can't imagine jail being much worse. So uh, we need help, but... I will say, email me, Moro at MoroRinello.com, and I mean that. And, and yet, just reach out to someone that you trust and care. We all have a friend. None of us are truly alone. You might think that, but you're not. Use social media. Go and tweet out. Hello there. I need help. Watch what happens. And all we need to do is open the lines of communication. And, and I hope... Uh, like I say, that this becomes, we, we talk about fights ad nauseum. We talk about the weather ad nauseum. We, we talk about reality shows ad nauseum. Can we start talking about something just a little more real? What you've accomplished in your professional career is amazing by any standards, but you know, knowing the daily battle that you have, uh, I think it, it makes it even more incredible. But where do you see your future? I mean, where do you see yourself growing professionally, doing, I mean, especially knowing how much of a struggle it is on a daily basis for you to, 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 to get to work, yeah. basically. Uh, yes, John. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, not even 50 years old and everything I could have imagined, and then some. It's, it's incredible. I definitely want to become a bigger and more, hopefully, prominent advocate for mental health issues, but I also believe that I can make it entertaining because uh, in history and throughout even our industry now and in the arts, Robin Williams, God rest his soul, man, my idol. I, I, he once said we're all touched by a little bit of madness, and we are in, in whatever way, shape, or form. For me, I want, I want to, to, to make it where you can wear your condition 
not be defined by it, but be proud of it. And, and whether it's through maybe a version of uh, Coachella that deals with the, the mental health issues. Imagine the artists. Imagine the musical acts. Imagine the comedians. The, and just have a stage where it literally is open mic and you go and tell your story without fear of, of judgment or scrutiny. I want to do a, a mental health podcast. But again, talk to the brilliant minds and talk to the entertainers. And, and you know what? In, in the end, I, I want to just become a voice of hope. I hope to do more uh, VO, voiceover work for audiobooks, maybe. Hey, if a movie trailer company looking for a new voice, a new up-and-comer, this young buck. Uh, but no, honestly, I, I do want to continue uh, as long as I can with WWE, Showtime, and Paramount Network. I love combat sports. I love the storytelling, and I'll do it for as long as they have me. But I, I definitely want to uh, uh, create... And, and, and a production company and an entertainment enterprise that, that has mental health at its core. What if somebody's watching this documentary and they don't necessarily identify with themselves, but they see somebody else in their life that they say, maybe that's what's going on with this person. Is it okay to reach out to that person 100%. or is that, is that taboo? That's exactly, John, what they need to do. Please, please, please do. Please, <laughs> please. And don't matter what they say, fight for it. If they say, no, nah, don't worry, well, how dare you, you know, or none of your business, keep, keep, scouting around because how many people, and again, I know firsthand, people that showed no signs, they had the perfect life dead at the end of the week. At the end of the day, what's the target audience here? Do you feel like, I mean, is, I, is it I combat sports fans? Nope, is it, you nope, know? No, nope. I, I want it to be the world. I really, truly do. And you know what? This, and thank you. The, it, I don't, I, I'm sure this is not for all ages viewing because it is pretty hard hitting. I would like to make, a, a, edit a version for kids. And, and schools, and I really believe, especially nowadays, the conversation has to start earlier and earlier, and we see it uh, in children. And, and again, instead of just simply medicating them, and you'll see what medication has done to me in this documentary. And, and by the way, I'm not here to rail against all big pharma, and I understand certain things help. I've seen what it's done to my mom. I've seen what it's done to myself. I, I, I'd prefer something that Mother Nature has provided me. Fair enough. We've talked about some heavy stuff. Let's, let's get some lighter sure. issues if you're all right. You know, one of the great scenes in there is, is the crowd chanting, Mamma Mia. Uh, you know, I thought that was a beautiful thing, a very high point for you. Where did that start? Where, yes, where did that phrase you. start? Um, it's a tribute to my mom. Uh, Duilia Ranallo was, uh, or is, is my, you know, my biggest supporter. And she has had the worst, probably, life of anyone I can imagine in terms of her health. She lost her eye when she was six years old in Italy. Um, she's been on long-term disability longer than I can remember. She has every health condition you can think of. And, and yet, <laughs> what a spirit. And, uh, yeah, just a tribute to my mom. Very beautiful. And it's, uh, yeah, so, because she, she's always been there for me. She drove me to the BCTV studios. I didn't have a license yet when I started my career. And she... Uh, yeah, she'd been put through the ringer by all of us, but especially me, because, again, when you don't understand something and you see your child in a hospital bed. But, uh, yeah, she's, she doesn't, she likes wrestling. She doesn't, she thinks MMA may be a little too violent. She likes some boxing, but she watches all of it. And that's because her, her boy is there, and that's, you know, it's not a, it's weird. I always thought, yeah, everyone has catchphrases. I don't need a catch, you know, catchphrases. But it's just, it is a tribute to my mom, and it has become something that has become much larger in the case in point at takeover when uh, Champ and Gargano ended up in my lap. My headset flew off and I've never, you know, you're right, I'm an announcer. I'm not a superstar or anything. And to have the crowd do that, that was uh, pretty, you know, I want to thank the crowd in, in New Orleans a lot. That was amazing. And it really did make uh, my mom feel cool too. So thank you guys for that. That's awesome. You know, you talk in the, in the documentary as well about, and, and this is advice I took from you years ago uh, and still believe, you know, in, in work, in, in broadcast work, in commentary work, you know, preparation everything. is everything. You got to have you prepare, it. bro. I know that even with what you do for work and all you guys, I said this to your cohorts at MMA Junkie Radio, you know, being on this side, bro, being the one who's interviewed, because like you say, I'm, I'm usually the one asking questions. It's different. It's amazing though, how many people don't do their prep. 
Well, where did you get that from? I wonder, I mean, was that something that you just realized or was that, did somebody born, instill that lesson? Born, my friend, and you'll see it in the doc too. For whatever reason, a curious mind out of the womb, I was, I was obsessed with knowledge very early. I was reading newspapers and books at a, a probably much younger age than I should have. And I, I just, I, I was obsessed with reading and it's been something I take to this day. I remember uh, about in my 20s, I used to have the newspaper and uh, my, uh, my friend's daughter, she was five at the time, I came walking up and she goes, Mommy, Uncle Mo doesn't have a newspaper. Is everything okay? Because <laughs> I have a, So I'm just, it's, it's, and it's weird because I try to incorporate as much as what I know or hear. Like I try to stay on top of pop culture, the music entertainment industry, to, because I truly believe that not everyone watching is going to be a diehard fan, but I hope I can try to connect somewhere. They're like, hey, that's pretty cool. And now I get it. Or, or I might just think, what's this idiot talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, MMA fans, we, we, we like to claim you as our own, but, uh, but you're doing some pretty big boxing stuff these <laughs> yeah. days, too. So I want to I get your thoughts. I mean, for years, it was like MMA versus boxing, and MMA, you know, you couldn't be a fan of both. I think Crazy. that's changing now, but Crazy. what's the idea? What's, what's the state of boxing right now? Give me an idea of the I, health. I have to tell you, man, and again, I've been just blessed, my friend. Do you understand? Like, I took over Showtime Championship Boxing at the end of September 2012. The beginning of 2013, Showtime signed Floyd Mayweather Jr., so in my first year of doing championship boxing, I am calling the biggest pay-per-view star in the game's fights against uh, Robert Guerrero, Canelo Alvarez, and so on and so forth. Boxing, and take it from my Hall of Fame broadcast partner, Al Bernstein, who is, you know, the, the preeminent, I feel, analyst and voice in, in the sport. You know, he's done this for over 30 years. And this, this last year and what we continue to see right now may be the best of them. And that's a huge credit to a man that not only championed my cause with the documentary, but Steven Espinoza making things happen. And, John, it's just like uh, what happened with the Monday Night Wars with WWE and WCW. Competition in any form should push everyone to be their best. And I believe that MMA, you know, and the success of the UFC and, and uh, you know, Bellator, all these promotions, it, 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 it propelled boxing to get, you know, it's head out of its butt, although at times the politics are still there. But what I mean is they have to put together the big fights that fans want to see, the best fighting the best. And now, I mean, in one year, sir, 2017, uh, Anthony Joshua versus Vladimir Klitschko, 90,000 fans at Wembley Stadium. Anthony Joshua, Carlos Takam in an indoor boxing record, 78,000 in Cardiff. Um, Mayweather McGregor. I, you know, it's, and again, you see me getting excited the way I do about a lot of stuff, but, and this is not just to sell it. Uh, boxing's in its best place. ESPN, uh, we have, of course, Showtime, HBO. We have uh, Eddie Hearn wanting to make waves. And again, this will hopefully make everyone say, okay, we got to put our best foot forward and, and put out the best product. And it's, it's, yeah, it's a great time to be a fan of combat sports, really. It is. You mentioned the, 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 the crossover fight, of course, Mayweather McGregor. We still hear rumblings that Floyd's, is, is Floyd going to get in an MMA cage? Uh. What did I say when they asked me about Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor in the boxing ring? He will do what Floyd wants to do, and we will watch it. As much as, you know, look at 50 Cent now and Scott Coker. I know you're hanging your head, but brother, you are, you're, a, you're a journalist, right? I've never called myself that. I don't have a degree. I'm never, I'm, I'm a broadcast personality, play-by-play -play guy, announcer, whatever. But the reason I say that, look at the rankings, John, or whatever ratings are. It doesn't, we don't live in that world as much as we would love to. We have to put butts in seats. We have to, well, they have a new TV deal, but we have to sell pay-per-views or, or sell events. And whatever it takes, there's, there, it's a noisy world. There's too much choice. And for me, honestly, in my position, I've lost a lot of work, believe it or not, as much as I work, because everyone's booking the same night and there's, there's competition always. So for me, we have to do whatever can make noise. Scott Coker wants to make noise. Should 50 Cent fight? Probably not. Again, if he steps in the cage, are we going to be watching? Probably yes. Well, I will absolutely be watching. So when you hear of like a, a Chuck Tito 3 possibly Again, happening. I don't want to see it. Because out of their, me, it's because I love and respect them so much, and I don't want to see them not to embarrass themselves because I don't want to disrespect them like that. But come on, guys. And, I, I, you know, look at Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time, marching him out at 38 to face the wrath of Larry Holmes, I still think, honestly, the people responsible for putting Ali in that situation should be in jail. You, what, 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 
especially fighting. I understand baseball and, and basketball and, and even football and hockey. Oh, those, those two are very, you know, violent sports. Fighting. You don't get better with age. You know, the Randy Coutures, the Bernard Hopkins, George Foreman, outliers. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about another crossover athlete then, Ronda Rousey. Woo! Lifelong, you know, wrestling fan that you are. Give us the evaluation. How's she doing over there? When uh, Paul Levesque, Triple H, uh, texted me about Ronda Rousey coming to WWE, I'm not going to lie. At first, I was like, wow. This schedule, this, she thought she was under the microscope before in the spotlight. I mean, WWE is a machine, a marketing machine. And as much as I look at boxing and, and UFC or MMA, Bellator, all of us, you look at WWE and this global reach, but the social media just, it's a juggernaut. And I thought, considering, as we now know, how she handled the losses and, and uh, hey, I pop in my condition, I may have been a lot worse. I, I just say, I wondered, I go, wow, is she going to be able, even though I'm sure she's not going to have the, the same schedule, and I know Brock Lesnar has a, an amazing uh, schedule, but I mean, in order for her to gain the respect of the crowd and even her peers, she's going to have to put the work in. He told me she was fully committed, and so when I saw her, and let's face it, her microphone work has never been the best, but so what? A Miracle Krokop, Vitor Emelianenko, she's, a, she's the baddest woman on the planet in many ways in her you know, Chris Cyborg, of course. I wish we would have saw that fight. Uh, but what happened at WrestleMania and her debut? And again, hyperbole aside, maybe one of the greatest debuts in, in sports entertainment history. And not only do we credit her, but man, oh, man. And, of course, you make an investment. But Triple H and Stephanie did yeoman's work and, and, and all involved. Kurt Angle. But, yeah, Ronda amazed everyone. I was in the crowd. I actually sat with my brothers way up in the, the crowd because I wanted to experience WrestleMania as a fan and never got to do that. And I'll tell you, she had the biggest pop of the night. Still gives me goosebumps. So if she can, uh, you know, continue to improve and, and stay hungry, because that's the other thing. She was the biggest, one of the biggest stars in, in the world and make the, all her money. So, but I, from what I understand, she is fully committed to the cause. So I, I'm cheering her on. You mentioned Fedor, you mentioned Krokop. I mean, you have a connection to Japanese MMA. Nothing's been able to replace Pride no. since then. But you understand the culture over there probably better than most. Do, do you see, uh, is there an opportunity for, a, a, you know, a big juggernaut in Japanese MMA? Or have those days passed us by? Uh, I, don't, I don't see it right now. I don't. I, and it's funny, I, being back in San Jose last Saturday for Bellator, I'm not going to lie. And, of course, San Jose, one of my favorite cities. And how many amazing events. Uh, you know, the, the town that Frank Shamrock built, really, when he kicked it off legally with uh, uh, Caesar Gracie. But w the reason I bring it up now, that, that presentation, and, again, Scott Coker, the connection to Japan, those temple shows for Bellator give me a slight, slight tinge of deja vu and, and like, okay, this is cool. And that's where, honestly, the UFC, which, again, they want to be sport, and that's great, but when they got rid of the ramp and everything because it was too much like WWE, and, and now, you know, it works what it works, but you do need, I believe, we are in the entertainment business first. And so, uh, for me, I think Bellator can do even more, and with the, the storytelling and, and character development, and as we've seen with guys like Dylan Dennis, who... Some crazy like a fox, as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Oh, I'm going to try to be kind of great. Whatever. Uh, Sean O'Malley. All the, these characters who are utilizing social media, the microphone. Uh, yeah, it's cliche. You don't all have to sound like pro wrestling heels or, Fred, or Floyd Mayweather. Be the best version of you. If you're the nicest guy in the world with a mean streak inside the cage, let's see that. If you, you know, let's, let's hear you market yourself, man. Well, I was going to say, man, I think there was, a, oh, there was a time when it was probably necessary to differentiate from pro wrestling, right? When people were trying to educate on mixed martial arts. But, yep. but now, maybe not, not so much. Buddy, anymore. I've always said this, and you brought it up in the past, uh, about boxing versus this, boxing versus that. <laughs> you know when I left Bellator MMA on Saturday night, and I was walking backstage? There was a section of the audience, and I heard the cheer, and I'm like, what the hell are they saying? Like, the fights are over. Maybe it's these local guys, and I'm listening, I'm listening. And they're chanting NXT at me. And I cheer, I acknowledge them. They go, so that's an MMA crowd acknowledging NXT. When I go to, hey, buddy, you're, you're, the, the, there's so much. And I believe there's still so much crossover to be done with all three in terms of whatever they want to do. I mean, I know business and, and ego and, and you, you know, we're the, we're the monsters. But 
I, I think there's there's so many fans that are fans of all three. And if you're not, that's fine too. But definitely you can coexist. There's, you're no longer a pariah. Look at DC, Daniel Cormier, who was in the house on Saturday. And, and so many, so many mixed martial artists are pro wrestling fans and vice versa. Who's the greatest mixed martial artist of all time? The greatest mixed martial artist of all time is get ready for this. Three letters, one word. Yes. <laughs> 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 and I'll be running for office next year, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Okay, honestly, the greatest heavyweight of all time is Fedor Emelianenko. Right. Greatest mixed martial artist of all time, man. How, uh, again, what are we talking about? Frank you got to show Frank Shamrock's name out there, here, right? He's, he's like, buddy, honest to God, and this is not because he's here and how much he's helped me. Frank Shamrock was the Conor McGregor of his day. Frank Shamrock came around at the wrong, wrong time for the sport and for everything else. 5-0, and oh, wrecking people, not even wanting to fight. He hated fighting, and yet baddest man on the planet. And, and then what he came out of retirement, what he did for Strike Force, what he did for MMA in California, what he did for MMA on network television, Frank Shamrock is right up there. But I would say right now, when you take in everything into consideration, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson is, is simply incredible. John Jones, Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre. Yes, but there's... They're still, I don't know, I see question marks everywhere there. I don't see any question marks with Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. All right, man. Well, you've been great with your time, Moore. Thank I appreciate you. it. Bipolar I appreciate Rock you, and Roller. Brother. Everybody's got to watch it. Thank you. Mental illness may be a life sentence for a lot of us, but it does not have to be a death sentence. Keep fighting the good fight.